Okay. So, um, uh, hello, welcome everybody to our seminar on cohomogeneous algebra, geometry, and, and physics and statistics. Uh, so today's talk will be more geometrical and, and we'll be given our speaker for today is Petr Zima and uh, his, the title of his talk is uh, Symmetry, Holonomy and Special Geometry. So please, the microphone is yours. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction. I'm Petr Zima from Charles University. Uh, <clears throat> I'm grateful for the invitation for this seminar. As the chairman said, this will be more geometrical. I'm expecting well, some wider audience, so it will, may sound elementary to experts, but I will try to comment more on some more interesting, uh, some in more interesting stuff. So. I will first recall some just some basic notions from differential geometry for those who are not for those who are not familiar. And then I will proceed to the <laughs> to the main topics of symmetries, holonomy, and special geometries, in particular special Riemannian geometries. So I will just I will, will try to go faster with this uh, with this basic stuff and if uh, if someone's not familiar don't hesitate to stop me and ask questions so this is about differential geometry so differential manifolds as probably everybody knows is a topological space with some open cover and we have coordinates charts which are homomorphisms to from these open sets u alpha to rn such that the transition maps which are defined on intersections of those open sets u alpha u, u beta and are uh, <coughs> defined by going back from rn by one map and going back uh, from rn uh, by one map and forward by another map and we require these transition maps to be differential for simplicity of class see infinity everything will be smooth so we can just <laughs> observe that we have the uh, well-defined differential of these transition maps and of course they are in the uh, at each point which is which is which is in the domain of the transition maps they are in the uh, uh, this differential lies in the general linear group in dimension n, which is the dimension of the manifold, that's because uh, we required the transition maps to be differentiable. And of course, they are invertible because the universe is just, <clears throat> we obtain the universe just by swapping alpha and beta. So the natural question is if we can introduce some additional uh, structure on M by choosing some restricted atlas of charts such that the differential would uh, <clears throat> would be inside some smaller group in some subgroup of uh, subgroup G, Lee subgroup G of this GLNR. And in some cases, this is really appropriate. Uh, for example, for complex manifolds, we just restrict our transition maps to complex linear maps and we get complex manifolds. But in general, this is the, this is too strong a notion. It leads to something which can be called completely integrable structures because it's on the level of the co uh, coordinate charts. And for example, for orthogonal group, we would get only locally flat Riemannian manifold. So, so it's a too strong a notion. So we pass to first order approximation, which will lead to almost complex structures, for example, or Riemannian manifolds in general. So we consider the tangent bundle which, uh, which has fiber r n over the manifold m defined as the uh, tangent vectors at each point of m uh, which <clears throat> and the tangent bundle captures the first order differential structure and as any fiber bu vector bundle or even fiber bundle in general we can make bundle charts 
uh, which are which are guaranteed by the definition of a vector bundle. Uh, it, this requires that the, <laughs> that the bundle must be locally trivial. In other words, the bundle charts are diffeomorphisms from uh, from the pre-image of some open set u alpha in the tangent bundle and it's it's diffeomorphic to the trivial bundle over the open set u alpha times r n where r n are the tangent vectors and of course we have this compatibility condition that <clears throat> that the projection the bundle projection appears in the first coordinate of this of this bundle chart uh, so we can again define the uh, look at the transition maps this is standard fiber bundle theory so we go back from u alpha times rn by one bundle chart and forward by another bundle chart and thanks to this uh, thanks to the condition oh um yeah i will check the spotlight it will be maybe better <laughs> so we will see what i'm talking about <laughs> Uh, uh, and of course, in the first coordinate, the the transition maps of the bundle charts are, uh, uh, are is just identity on the domain, which is which is some open set, which is the intersection of the two open sets in the manifold M. So we can capture the transition maps just by smooth maps psi alpha beta, which go from u alpha intersect. Uh, u beta times rn to rn and if we fix some point x in the first component we again get mapping from rn to rn which which is inside the general linear uh, group because tangent bundle is not just fiber bundle but vector bundle okay and now uh, at this first order level we define the reduction of the structured group of tangent bundle in this case to a G is some restricted atlas of bundle charts such that the, the maps psi alpha beta, which come from the transition maps, <laughs> go just in the subgroup G. This is called a G structure. The bundle chart may or may not be induced from coordinate charts. That, that was the point. If, all, uh, if all of them were induced from the uh, bundle charts, then the, this psi alpha beta would be just these differentials of the transition maps on the coordinate level, and we wouldn't get anything new. But we can have vector bundle ch uh, bundle charts for the tangent bundle, which are not induced by the by the coordinates coordinate charts, and this leads to uh, something which could be called non-integrable structures because we cannot integrate this first level transition uh, first order transition maps back to some transition maps of the coordinates so this is these are the basic notions oh, oh. oh i'm sorry what the problem with the mouse <laughs> Okay, and uh, how to capture this reduction? This is some additional structure to the differential manifold. So a typical, so typical, uh, typical way how to how to capture this reduction, this additional structure, is uh, that we uh, that we look at the tensor spaces of the general uh, general rank of uh, R times contravariant and S times covariant. Those are, of course, canonically representations of GLNR, and then it's inherited as a representation of the smaller group G. And if you have an invariant tensor K0 in this tensor spaces of G, then it induces a distinguished tensor field K on M. We just pull this K0 back by the, by the uh, distinguished G-compatible bundle charts, and glue them by the transition maps, but the transition maps 
uh, are in G, so they uh, leave K0 fixed, so it really glues together, uh, uh, glues together well. Conversely, if we have some distinguished tensor field, so we can denote its value in these standard fiber spaces TRS, which are just the tensors over Rn, and by abuse of notation, I will just denote by psi alpha also the charge on these tensor bundles, which are which are canonically induced by this original bundle charts on TM by means of tensor products and stuff. Uh, and now uh, there is a crucial condition uh, so that this tensor field K defines some reduction that those values k x alpha must belong to the same orbit with respect to the general linear group at all points. And then we may define the subgroup G as the stabilizer of some, we, we choose some point and some chart and take the value k zero and we can define the subgroup as the stabilizer of this value k zero inside GLNR. And this really determines the reduction of the structure group. We take originally complete, complete atlas of the bundle charts with all admissible bundle uh, bundle charts, uh, thanks to this uh, thanks to this assumption of the same orbits. Uh, we we just pick those those bundle charts in uh, with respect to which the value of our global tensor field looks like this k0 value. So this is, this is alternative without how to specify, specify uh, <laughs> additional structure on differential manifold. And another structure which we will use on differ uh, the differential manifold is affine connection, which is, uh, which is just special case of linear connection. Uh, acting on vector fields, so it's mapping from vector fields, sine vector fields to vector fields, which is R bilinear in both components, but C, uh, C infinity linear in the first component X. So we can multiply by functions and it satisfies the Leibniz rule in the second argument Y. Uh, here are the classical <laughs> formulas for the curvature and the torsion of an affine connection. And in particular, uh, we can we can look at if we have a G structure, we can look at G connections, which are uh, compatible with the G, G structure. And one way to say this is that uh, in each G compatible chart, if we just again map all the values by the bundle charts and look just at the second component. Which, which, which lives in the st standard fiber, then the connection uh, uh, differs from partial derivative just by action of some one form gamma alpha, which depends on the chart, which takes values in the Lie algebra G of the, of the structure, structure group G, so, so this is one way how to say it. Of course, all of this is to, is more usually formulated in the language of principal G bundles, but for simplicity and some wider audience, those are com also completely well definitions. So, in summary, we, uh, we uh, additional structure on M gives us some G structure in this case. In a, in, in our cases. Or it can be defined by some structure tensor or more structure tensors, which will reduce the group further. And we have some preferred connections. Of course, the relationship between these three is not really one to one. Those, uh, we can induce, uh, uh, induce, for example, the G structure from the structure tensor, but we uh, in general we can we, we cannot get a unique structure tensor uh, if we are given just the g structure the reduction and similarly there can be more preferred connection more g connections uh, which are compatible with the g structure 
So it's not uh, so it's not really one to one, but we will work with all this all this structure. Yes, may I make a, a comment? Yeah. So that's a, 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 a corresponding between key structure and structure tensor is a thing that we discussed a bit with the um, uh, Kotaro Kavai last week seminar. Yeah, he says that the difference is the uh, structure of the G two. Yes, in seven, uh, and then the we don't have the uh, uniqueness of the tensor of film, yeah, but a uh, uh, form three form associative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, I will talk about that. It will be one of yeah, yeah, yeah. Examples. And the same, but that yeah. is a uh, unique up to conform one, yeah. So depend. Very yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 yeah, yeah. The, 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 at first, the, the, they, they can be defined up to constant or up to function, of course. So that is the conformal class, yes. And you, uh, but, 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 exactly. but conformal class cannot be defined this way. Yeah, so depend, of course, it depends is... not on everything. But so in the case of G2, uh, in several cases, for example, yeah. that's, um, that is uh, also follow from the classification of the um, orbit of the, I mean, that's a, 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 a reaction of the tensor, right? You, you look at it. So you have many ways how to see this relation. Yeah, yeah. The, the, in this way, I meant uh, one, one, uh, one fixed tensor field, or later it will be also the spinner field, or more, but more fixed. Uh, the, this one I'm talking here is the reductive case of first order, first order G structures, and for example, conformal and projective geometry don't uh, don't fall under this setting. There we have some equivalence classes of structure tensors or equivalence classes of connections. So, so uh, not sure if I <laughs> answered uh, answered your question, but. Um, so thank but you. here I will I mean some. Much, some... Uh, donation is our previous uh, talk. At, at, uh, even go faster last, uh, last year that uh, Francesco Catafi also gave very uh, close uh, talk on this thing, but the uh, integrability of community structure, yeah, but yeah. Uh, from different point of view. So you can look at the website in the research seminar. There's been, uh, I think that you record his uh, talk on the YouTube, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so I will con continue with this uh, with this fun <coughs> basic stuff. So, uh, of course, you can pick torsion-free connections, with, uh, which which is related to Spencer cohomology and the integrability of of the structure. But in some cases, connection with suitable non-zero torsion is better. Uh, in fact, the Riemannian geometry, where the, the structure group is the orthogonal group, is the is the ideal one for picking torsion-free connection because there is, there, there, there is the one. It's it's large enough to admit torsion-free connections and small enough to to have this connection unique. But if we if we further reduce to smaller group, then <clears throat> there need not to be any torsion-free connections and a good good connection compatible with, uh, with the structure will necessarily have some non-zero torsion. And uh, of course, the preferred connections, uh, because they are compatible with the G structure and the structure tensor is defined as some invariant of the structure group, then uh, the, the structure tensor is parallel with respect to the preferred connection. So this will be the general setting. The main example are Riemannian and manifold. So just briefly, we have just some positive definite uh, metric on the tangent bundle. Of course, the GLNR orbits on symmetric bilinear forms are just given by the signature. So the positive definiteness assures that we are in the same orbit. So this so the metric gives us reduction to the orthogonal group and conversely reduction determines the metric, but up to a constant scale. Uh, all incompatible connections are, of course, metric connections, which are those the, such, such, such that the derivative of the metric is zero, and there is the unique Levi-Civita connection, uh, which I denote by nabla G, that is metric and torsion-free. Conversely, there may exist more metrics, G prime, such that they are parallel with respect to our Levi-Civita connection, nabla G, 
even modulo the risk scalings. This depends on the holonomy and the number of invariants. If the holonomy is some smaller group than the orthogonal group, then we could have more metrics. For Riemannian manifolds, there are no global obstructions. We are interested in further reductions to subgroups of ON, and it may involve more compatible metrics, connections with torsion, as I have already noted, and some global topological obstructions. But I won't discuss it here. I focus just on the local properties and, uh, and some PDEs, basically, which define the structures. So the second part, I will, to, I will just recall what are symmetries and the geometry of homogeneous spaces. So symmetries are just deformorphisms from the manifold to itself that preserve the additional structure. Infinitesimal symmetries are just vector fields that generate symmetries or just locally generate symmetries if, <laughs> if the manifold is not complete in some sense. If the structure is given by some tensor k as a stabilizer of this of the value of k, then, then the infinitesimal symmetries, the vector fields, the vector field xi is infinitesimal symmetry if and only if the lead derivative of the structure tensor along the vector field uh, is zero. And this is basically just a system of partial differential equations for Xi, as we will see in the, uh, again in the case of Riemannian geometry. Homogeneous spaces are just manifolds which have many symmetries, particularly a Lie group G of symmetries which act smoothly and transitively on M. So it's a smooth mapping, G times M to M, and we define uh, and if we pick a point, we we define. Uh, as usual, it's isotropy subgroup, which is the subgroup of G, which fixes the point, and this is uh, and this is then a closely subgroup of G, and the manifold is diffeomorphic to the coset space G mod G mod H, and of course uh, this this isomorphism carries also also the structure. That's the point. Because uh, because we uh, we restricted ourselves just to some symmetries which preserve the structure. Of course, I have the canonical projection, which is we, 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 <coughs> from G to the coset space G mod H, which is equivalent to M, and this is this is the H principal bundle. And if we, we would like to look at H compatible bundle charge from this restricted atlas, which defines some uh, the additional structure with structure group H. Then the local sections of uh, the, the, then these uh, H-compatible bundle charts are in one, just in one-to-one -one correspondence to local sections uh, as from M to G or some open subset to G, just local sections. And of course, local sections are defined by this equation. So the structure group of the tangent bundle and all the so-called natural bundles, for example, tensor bundles constructed from, from the tangent bundle is, red, uh, is reduced canonically to H. In more detail, the standard fiber of the tangent bundle of the homogeneous space is just the quotient of the Lie algebra G mod Lie algebra H, which has the dimension, which must have the dimension N. And, and, and the group H act, uh, acts by uh, the ad, adjoint representation with, <coughs> with, with underbar, which, uh, which is constructed just from the, from the usual adjoint representation of group G on its Lie algebra small g by restricting to H. And then projecting down to this G mod H. I'm sorry, here, here we should have mod H. Uh, in, in, in case the, the adjoint representation uh, 
restricted to H is not is not faithful. We can just factor out the center intersected with H to make to make this representation at injective and just so so we really get some group H which is uh, which which this way is embedded in GLNR. So so this is this is how the tangent bundle. Uh, of the homogeneous spaces look like. And G invariants, tensor fields on M are just in one-to-one -one correspondence with at underbar H invariants, tensors K0 uh, over, over this standard fiber G mod H. And this is, again, this K0 is, again, the value at some distinguished point. In our case, the origin, the H viewed as uh, as a coset itself. And there is some, there is a theorem which describes uh, all G invariant affine connections. So this gives us, so uh, this will complete the description, all the, uh, the three structures, the structure group, the, uh, the invariant tensors, and now the invariant affine connections on the homogeneous space are in bijective correspondence with linear maps alpha from the Lie group G to the re re real linear maps from G mod uh, H to G mod H, from real endomorphisms of G mod H, such that the restriction of alpha on the Lie algebra H is just differential of the, of the representation at underbar and it intertwines the mapping alpha intertwines the left f action of the adjoint representation of H on the uh, elements of the Lie algebra, elements X of the Lie algebra G. It intertwines this, ac intertwines this action with the conjugation by at underbar H by this, by the. by this formula. <laughs> special case, which, which, uh, which, uh, which, is, which will be our case in the special Riemannian geometries, is when we have reductive homogeneous spaces, space, which is uh, such that there exists a complement M to the Lie algebra H in the bigger Lie algebra G, but such that this complement is at H invariant. So in this case, we can, of course, from this splitting, we get canonical projections to the H component and M component. And we can construct linear map alpha M exactly of this form that we first project on, on the smaller Lie algebra H and then just use the different the differential of the of the at underbar representation and it's uh, it, it, it's uh, it's almost evident that this linear map satis satisfies the assumptions of the theorem and and so it induces g invariant connection which is which is determined just by just by choosing the comp uh, complement. In general, the complement needs not to be need, needs not needs not to be unique. For example, if we look at the Bakley group G and decompose it to irreducible components with respect to at H, there can be some multiplicities, and if we have some isomorphic components both in H and G mod H, there can be some tilting or how to say it which gives us uh, which gives us some freedom in choosing the comp uh, in choosing the in choosing the complement which uh, which affects the g invariant connection we will get uh, Peter, yes i just wanted to ask a very basic question uh, so in the uh, in this term, reductive homogeneous space. What, what is reductive referred to exactly? Uh, reductive. It really means there is uh, reductive means that there is uh, there is uh, the at H invariant complement. For example, if H is is reductive group, mm -hmm. then you uh, then you will get this complement because of course 
H itself is at uh, is, is at H invariant. So, so this is very uh, or or it's it's called in the context of Cartan geometry, so reductive. I see. Okay. G, so G H pair. So. So so some under some conditions on the group, all homogeneous spaces are reductive. But if the group is not reductive, then only some some homogeneous spaces are satisfy this condition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 If, if if H is reductive, yeah. This in contrast to parabolic geometry is where it has some uh, some uh, some nil potent part and and is not reductive. So we are in the from the point of view of Cartan geometries, we are in the trivial reductive case where we can find at H invariant complements. But that terminology of reductive, I mean, that's a concept already introduced in the classical book by uh, Kobayashi no Mitsu, yeah, foundation yeah. of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is the, yeah, this is classical notion of re reductive. So in this case, we, we, we can easily induce uh, connect G invariant connections from, from these complements and the torsion of this connection is, uh, is induced just from the algebraic Lie bracket, just projected on the M component. So we take uh, some elements of M, X, and Y, which just are models in the standard fiber of some two tangent vectors. We take the Lie bracket and again project on the, uh, and project again on the uh, on the M component. So, so this way there, there is also some minus sign, and, and, but, but it's in the, the torsion, it's computable just from the Lie bracket uh, projected on the M component. So again, our <laughs> simplest example, the Riemannian manifold isometries are of course, deformorphisms which preserve the metric. So that the pullback of G is, equal to G and infinitesimal isometries are well-known killing vector fields. And, uh, and in this case of Riemannian geometry, we can rewrite the original definition of infinitesimal isometry that the lead derivative along Xi of G is a zero into this differential equation where we, uh, uh, where we visibly differentiate the tensor, uh, the, uh, the vector field Xi itself. And this equation basically tells us that, that the derivative of Xi uh, is, uh, is skew symmetric with respect to the metric G. We can also dualize the vector field because we have the metric. So we can dualize the, uh, the killing vector field uh, to uh, killing one form eta, uh, eta, or sometimes called killing Yano, one form. And then we can really write it as that the, the, the derivative unevaluated derivative of eta is skew symmetric. So it necessarily must equal to some, to some two form. And the two form is just twice the differential of eta because because our uh, because our uh, connect the Levitschewitz connection is torsion free, so the eta is really the skew symmetrization of the of the of the of the covariant derivative. In other words, we can we can decompose the first derivative of the one form into symmetric and skew symmetric part, and so another equivalent formulation of killing vector fields is that. Uh, that the symmetric part, which is the highest weight component, uh, the symmetric part of the uh, covariant derivative vanishes. This is again an example of so uh, of the so-called first BGG operators in much in much more general uh, setting of uh, of the parabolic geometries. In particular, this exact equation corresponds to first BGG operator in, uh, in projective geometry. So this equation is, uh, this equation is even when written in the covariant form with the, with the one form, this is even projectively, projectively invariant in some sense if we pick some appropriate weights. So this, so this is the description of 
isometries and infinitesimal isometries in Riemannian geometry. And we have, uh, and uh, there, is the, the, there is a fundamental theorem of Myers and Steenrod that the Riemannian geometry is rig in some sense rigid enough that the isometries of any Riemannian manifold, uh, of any Riemannian manifold, always form a Lie group that works smoothly on M. So we have no problems with having too, too many isometries or something like that. So homogeneous Riemannian spaces, those are just, again, the quotients G mod H with G invariant met metric. This, this, is, uh, this means that H preserves the, the metric or, or to be more precise, the G zero value at the origin. And that's the, uh, and that's the isotropy group H must be compact. And so the pair GH is always, always reductive uh, for homogeneous Riemannian spaces. Finding all the G invariant metrics and the affine connections is, is basically just a representation theoretic problem, which reduces to some Lie algebra computation. We can also compute the full isometry group of the, uh, of the homogeneous space in question or at least the connected component, we can really first compute the infinitesimal uh, isometries on the Lie algebra level, and then, uh, then, then just integrate them, for example, by some matrix exponential, but at least on the Lie algebra level or for the connected component of the identity, we can really compute, compute, compute the full isometry group algorithmically Again, just by some linear algebra, and this way, if we if we look at the isotropy group inside this full isometry group G prime, we get basically the largest possible isotropy group H prime. So we can, of course, we can ask questions that there can be more different realizations of the same manifold as G mod H with different Gs and H. And, in this, uh, and computing the full isometry group gives us the largest possible isotropy group, which still preserves the structure given in this case, the metric. But of course, if we would have some additional structure, we could restrict ourselves only, only, only to isometries or infinitesimal isometries, which which preserve also <coughs> the, the additional structure except for G. So in this case, we can find the largest possible isotropy group. Uh, Peter, sorry, can I mention something? Uh, yeah. I mean, I you, pre you present these final problems like they are trivial. But it's, it, it's, it's not wait, wait, trivial, it's an iterative computation. One of these are trivial. Actually, the, to find the isometry group, he finds Onisig with his uh, theory of enlargement. That is not trivial theory. It's not uh, easy to understand. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's comp uh, it, on a homogeneous Riemannian space. The has multiplicities. Believe me, it's not trivial to classify all invariant metrics. That is easy because you have a Gauss group that acts. This Gauss group is this mediate, the normalizer of uh, isotropic group mod the isotropic group. That if you have a uh, uh, multiplicity, it's not trivial the action, and then the invariant metrics is not necessarily diagonal and not easy to classify as you claim. And the same appears in affine connections as we do with turning in the paper. If you have multiplicities, these questions may be turn out to be some linear algebra, but are not trivial, believe me. Oh, okay, okay. None of these questions yeah. did turn out to be so trivial as presented. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely we, the, we can compute the, the infinitesimal isometries, the full the algebra of infinitesimal isometries just by some iterating, iterating some, some Gaussian eliminations and looking when the dimension drops. This, this, this is really possible completely algorithmically and then there's just the question of, uh, of, of integrating, of integrating this this infinitesimal isometries to some to, to the to the isometric 
in group. So okay, it's it can it it's, it's can be can can be complicated, but it's possible and and at least to some degree completely the alg algorithmical. So now the third, yeah, okay, I should erase the wrongs. So so the <clears throat> the the next. Uh, the next notion, the next topic, which uh, which uh, <laughs> which gives us some understanding of the structure group are holonomy groups, which are uh, which are defined for a differential manifold with connection, and for simplicity, we assume that the, the manifold is connected, so that we get conjugated holonomy groups on the whole manifold. So I just again recall that we have. A, affine connection, it means linear connection in tangent bundle. We have the parallel transport in the tangent bundle. We have some curve C and M. Then for, uh, then for each starting tangent vector at the starting point CA, there is a unique curve in the tangent bundle X, XT, such that it starts at this prescribed XA, projects, on the on the cur uh, curve at the, uh, in the base manifold, and in, and and the, the tangent and the curve in the tangent vector is covariantly constant, just but just along the curve, of course, just along the curve in the uh, in the direction of the tangent vector c dot t. So this is the, uh, the definition, and then then if we uh, then if we are given a curve, uh, we, we get uh, we all together applying to all possible starting tangent vectors. We of course get this uh, this parallel transport from the tangent bundle at the point C A to the tangent bundle at the point C B along the curve. This is uh, this is linear and closed under compositions and inverses. So altogether, if we look just at the closed loops, we get the holonomy group at reference point X, which is the start and end of the, of the loop. By some abuse of notation, we can regard it as a subgroup of GL and R by choosing a chart which counts on some neighborhood of the point X. Or if we were already given some G, uh, G structure and the G connection, then the holonomy group can be via some chart uh, regarded as a subgroup of the structure group G. If we choose different charts or different reference points, then, then these holonomy groups are always conjugated in G, L, and R or G. Thanks to the connectedness on different com uh, components, the holonomy groups could be completely different, of course. And we have the main theorem, the reduction theorem that distracted that if we have manifold with affine connection, then the structure group can be reduced to the holonomy group of the connection. And this way, the connection becomes an H compatible connection. And this way, we get. On the contrary, the smallest possible structure group, which still, <laughs> which is still large enough to carry the connection as an H connection and H compatible connection. Clearly, if if we have some parallel tensor field with respect to the connection, then it's the same on a connected manifold. That it's invariant of the of the holonomy group. Again, the value at some point X is invariant of, uh, of the holonomy group. And we have also the notion of infinitesimal holonomy, which is the Lie algebra, whole X, which is just a subalgebra of the general linear algebra of the tangent space at the given point. And this infinitesimal holonomy is generated by the values of the curvature of the connection and the derivatives of the curvature. So it's written like that. We, do, we just substitute all possible tangents vector, tangent vectors into the curvature, then all possible tangent vectors to the de first derivatives in 
uh, in all directions, etc. Uh, in general, in general, up to up to infinity, and we get some operators, linear operators on the tangent bundle, and we generate a Lie algebra from these operators. And there are there are there are some more fine grained uh, theorems which tell us when this infinitesimal holonomy is actually the Lie algebra of the holonomy group. It's not automatic. And there are some fine grained theorems which which look at some regularity, some constant rank, uh, some constant rank of some subspaces uh, uh, in, the, in the tangent bundle. But uh, one, one corollary or theorem on itself is that if, if the manifold M is real analytic and the connection is also real analytic, then it's the case that the regularity conditions are satisfied and hence, and hence uh, the holonomy, the, the infinitesimal holonomy Lie algebra is indeed the Lie algebra of the holonomy group. So again, on a homogeneous, uh, homogeneous spaces with G invariant connections are real analytic. So we can, and we have, uh, we can again compute the curvature and the derivatives and the, the derivatives just by means of linear algebra, just by taking this time the H part of the commutator. So can, this is again computable because we don't, uh, in, in case of homogeneous spaces, some stronger, uh, <laughs> stronger regularity conditions. Peter, Out. Uh, uh, yeah. may I uh, yes, ask you a question? Of course, I, uh, not of course, I know some uh, theorem for certain holonomy group that the um, manifold then is um, analytic, Riemannian manifold uh, is analytic. But as, uh, as you say, that's a zero general theorem that uh, every uh, special holonomy manifold is uh, analytic, right? So, so there is some general theorem. Oh, okay, I was not aware of this, thank you. <laughs> Is that your theorem? And, and uh, uh, I'm just uh, saying that homogeneous spaces. Ah, only homogeneous. H okay. With, with the invariant for for uh, connection. Is like uh, because you consider the Laplace, yeah. So if Laplace operator, I, I remember the proof, yeah. So for G two uh, KLA, of course, the KLA analytic because of com uh, complex. Yeah, yeah, of course. But G two spin seven on this the thing is analytic, so I I know the proof, but I yeah. I never think in the term of the general theorem. Uh, if you consider only uh, home, then if you have the general theorem, yeah. Uh, if is a real analytic. If if, okay. if yeah yeah here is if it's real real analytic then. Okay. Then the yeah. holonomial yeah. algebra, infinite yeah. okay. Lie algebra, is the Lie algebra of the holonomy group. So again, at least on the Lie algebra level, we get uh, we get the whole component of identity. We are able to exponentiate to to the group. And homogeneous spaces are an rather simple example of real analytic uh, of real analytic maybe, manifolds. Maybe it is just sufficient to assume that your manifold is smooth and connected. What do you win if you say about real ana analytic? Oh, well, once more, please. What you win? What extra you win if you speak about real analytic? Because you 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 get the case is that you have a manifold and it's connected, and then you can uh, identify the restricted holonomy group with the holonomy group, and oh, the, oh, the restricted holonomy group is the. Oh, you really the cannot. The you algebra can... immediately. You can what you cannot. You, you you really cannot uh, imagine that you have some flat space. You cannot and, on, on, uh, some on some flat manifold. page and glue it with some bump functions with some curved space. Then then the infinitesimal holonomy. The, the book of Joy says something different then because uh, in any connected yeah function, yeah just simply imagine some flat patch glued with bump functions to some curved patch, and then the infinitesimal holonomy. So you claim that the interior of the of the flat patch will look trivial, but but you can but if you look at the holonomy group or even the restricted holonomy group, you can make paths 
which go to the curved patch and there that, and in the curved patch they accumulate some non-trivial holomony and then go back so 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 it's re uh, some assumption of uh, of uh, of regularity is really needed and real analyticity is the strongest assumption actually one of the strongest assumptions, but yeah, you need some assumptions. That finally, you can relax. This is just smooth and yeah. oh, oh, Of course, you can you you can relax it, but because actually, when you go to homogeneous space, it's always we assume that if you go to homogeneous space, space everything is, is everything is and very nice, very nice, some very strong. So, very strong. Like that, what you why you want to say about real analytics? Yeah, I, I, it was just, uh, well, I mean, if it's, was... basic, uh, if it's something basic that actually I don't see where real analytic apply in this finally. Uh, 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 okay, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's not uh, it, 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 it's not the main goal of my talk. I might uh, I may I may show you, show you sometimes it's uh, the the precise. The I mean, I think that's precise, or you can find it in Kobayashi. If you look at the at the finer theorems, when when the infinitesimal Lie algebra or infinitesimal Lie group coincides with the local holonomy, and when it coincides with the reduced holonomy, so in okay. general they can be different. Okay. So usually, you are going need to some assumptions to like the analyticity. Yeah. So. I will speed up a bit. <laughs> so in our case, in the Riemannian holonomy is of course in a suitable chart a subgroup of the orthogonal group. And for Riemannian holonomy, we have we, we have a very very detailed structure theory. The first part of the structure theory is the Durham decomposition theorem, which, for example, in its local version, tells us that we can. That, uh, that, that we can locally decompose Riemannian manifolds into product of irreducible manifolds and some Euclidean space. And this is reflected by the decomposition of the holonomy group, again, considered, considered locally. Uh, so, and each of these holonomy groups of, of these individual components, except for the Euclidean component, then must irreduce, act irreducibly on the tangent spaces. So it's, so it's rather strong restriction on the holonomy of the levitch with a connection of a, uh, of a Riemannian manifold. And another very, very important result is the so-called Berger or Berger-Simons list, which tells us what are the possible holonomies of irreducible Riemannian manifolds that are not symmetric spaces and symmetric spaces. So, so we have this list of orthogonal, special orthogonal, unitary, special unitary, sp1, spk, spk, g2, and spin7. Those are the only possible Riemannian holonomies, except for the symmetric spaces. But symmetric spaces are classified via, via the simple <laughs> real forms of simple E groups. So, so we basically have all the, <laughs> all the possibilities. Exhausted. So this is this was the general theory, and uh, and now I will will go to the examples of special geometries. So already mentioned, and very simple case are Keller manifolds in even dimension to M. First, we define uh, first the almost complex structure is just some tangent bundle endomorphism, such that it squares to minus identity. And almost their mission structure is then almost complex structure plus Riemannian metric, which are compatible. It can be written, for example, that the, the involution, the almost complex structure acts isometrically. And the most Mo, uh, in, in, in some sense, most integrable or, mo, or symmetric case of these almost dimension structures are Keller manifolds, which are almost dimension structures, such that the almost complex structure J is parallel with respect to the Levi Civita connection, or equivalently, the holomonomy of the Levi Civita connection itself is contained in the unitary group U, UM. Those are automatically integrable. The integrability is given by the 
Nian Hu's tensor, which basically contains some components of the covariant derivative of J. And if the whole derivative of J is, is, is zero, then the Nian Hu's tensor is also, also vanishes and, uh, and, and so the structure is integrable. In other words, M is a complex manifold. An odd dimensional analog of Keller manifolds are Sasekian manifolds which are in, in odd dimension two and plus one. And here there is a, the structure is, is more complicated, uh, but you may know the alternative definition via metric cone. The Sasekian manifold is a manifold whose metric cone with, uh, is Keller manifold, but described in terms of the structure tensors we have some vector field psi one form eta and tangent bundle endomorphism phi such that the tangent bundle endomorphism phi square is almost the minus identity as in the case of killer manifold but we have this odd dimension uh, this one odd dimension more given by the given by the vector field psi and the one form eta where we cannot have of course almost complex structure because it's odd and it's and just algebraically the 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 compat the, com the conditions are these two equations and then we again come make uh, may combine this with with uh, with the Riemannian metric and the compatibility is again similar like in the Keller case up to the odd dimension which we have more and so there is again some correction and Sasakian manifold is again in some sense the most symmetric case of these almost contact metric structures and it can be written in in, uh, in different ways, but this can be written as a single differential equation, which uh, which uh, tells us how how the mm, the covariant derivative of the uh, of the bundle endomorphism phi with respect to the Levi-Civita connection looks like. So, so this is this is one way to write it, and uh, and in both these cases, when we start with almost Hermitian or almost contact metric structures, we have many. Mm, there are many classes uh, of uh, many classes uh, of the structures which are which are defined by weaker weaker differential equations than than these two. But those are the strongest, the most symmetric cases. And uh, the Sesekian manifolds are an example where a modified connection with torsion is better, more suitable to capture the structure. If we, uh, if we construct this modified connection given by this formula, which in, involves this psi, Phi and each other, capital Phi is just uh, is uh, is just uh, orthogonal dual of the uh, of the uh, of the small Phi. Then this connection is again metric, and its torsion. If we dualize the torsion, it's completely skew symmetric, and it can be written as two eta wedge capital Phi. And there is uh, and there is a uh, there is a theorem that the structure, the almost contact metric structure, is Sasakian if and only if the vector field psi is the rep vector field psi basically from the contact structures and the endomorphism phi are both parallel with respect to this connection and equivalently the holonomy of this modified connection with torsion is, is contained with unitary group acting on those two m dimensions and leaving the one dimension given by the vector field psi fixed so so now by 
to introducing suitable torsion, we arrive with rather nice description of this most symmetric case, but it's not the Levi-Civita connection. And there's another theorem that Seseki and manifolds can be described just solely in terms of the one form each by differential equations, which are called, which defines something which is special killing one form. The first equation base is basically the equation for the killing Yan one forms. And we have another equation in, which gives some special killing one forms. And again, Sasekian structures are equivalent to unit special killing one forms. Oh, I'm sorry for being a bit over time, but I have two more examples. Yeah, we are running out of time. So you yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I hope everybody knows yeah, spinors. Yeah. Here is just quick recapitulation that we have some complex spinor space, Clifford multiplication, and up to, uh, up to some topological abstractions, we can lift all this spin structure to many and manifold. And there are there are interesting differential equations defining so-called killing spinors, which is very easy that the derivative of the spinor is given by the killing, killing multiplication. And recently, me and my supervisor Peter Schomburg we introduced equation which we call second order killing spinors, which really involves second derivative and looks in this form. And in very uh, and in very natural way generalizes the killing spinors and i will skip the g2 g2 structure maybe i will return if you are interested uh, the last example are three sesekian manifolds which consist of three sesekian structure with common compatible metric g subject to these algebraic compatibility conditions and we managed to prove after some detours to G2 structures that Trisosakian manifolds in dimension seven is characterized by uh, existence of a unit second order killing spin or psi pardon, it should be written primitive, which is just some detail that it's not already killing spin or. So we got a correct equivalent spinorial characterization of the of the three Sasekian manifolds via some second order killing spinors. This is really related to G2 structures, which, which can be defined via either tree form or a spinor as well. And actually, the three Sasekian structures in dimension seven uh, are related. They have their canonical G2 structure, we just deform the metric in in completely prescribed way from the three Sasakian to G2 metric. And this second order killing spinor with respect to the three Sasakian structure is the very same as the defining spinor of the, of the G2 structure. And the G2 structure in this case is nearly parallel, as, which means that the defining spinor is a killing spinor. So thank you. Yeah, so, attention. Yeah, thank you very much for your lecture. So, thank you. Yeah, you, you see the uh, closing. So, so, so anybody, I mean, um, you, you can ask whatever you want. So, related to the, to the lecture. So, one is, uh, uh, yeah, so one, yeah, it's, it's your time. Please ask. So can I ask you something? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, in this last slide, uh, I want to understand a bit this second order spinor. No, no, in the last slide. This, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this second order uh, killing spinor. First, uh, okay, first, what is the motivation behind this equation? How you arrive in this equation? Uh, yeah. second, uh, give me a second. And second, the killing spinors are already eigenspinors of the Dirac operator with eigenvalue minus n. So what is this uh, second order killing spinners relative with the Dirac operator? And then third, I think- They are not eigenspinners of the Dirac operator. These are not probably, yes. I yeah, but, but originally we discovered it. It's, uh, we studied killing spinner valued forms. Yes, okay. Which was just some combination of the killing equations for spinors and for P forms. And then we also introduced the notion of special 
of special special spinner valued forms like like the yes, yes, I, structure I, I, is equivalent to special killing one form yeah. and this equation is basically the degree zero case of special killing p forms okay then maybe it is really interesting um yeah, and and to the previous slide please can you go a bit to the previous slide in the previous slide for example for sasakian you have a a connection with Q torsion, of course, given by eta with the eta. This free capital is your d eta, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It follows can, that, that, what, that what phi is, is the, d, d, d. What you can take that is natural to take, you have this uh, connection that preserves the Sasakian structure, that of course is the Levis Vita connection plus eta with beta up to a factor. And then you can leave this in the spinner band, and then you can go again to the next last page. Yeah. I, I, have, I haven't tried actually to look you can for this. Think, actually, it's very natural. You can think because already yeah. for killing spinners, you can think for killing spinners with torsion. Okay, there are written some papers on this, but then you can uh, think uh, about uh, your integrability condition, these second order killing spinners, how can I apply with torsion? So take your spinorial connection, add the torsion, take another spinorial connection with torsion, and then see how this is related. I think it's a natural question. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe you could, you, you could, you could. You I mean, could modify, is... mod, mod, modify the, mo, mo, modify the uh, the Levi-Civita connection in a way yes. so that the second-order killing spinner becomes a killing spinner or, or even parallel. For tau zero, exactly. For when your torsion is zero, you can uh, re, you can reduce back to this uh, new nice new notion that we introduce. But for non-trivial torsion, then you will have an extension of this. Probably, I don't know if you will take some benefit, but you can check what is the relation. Again, it will have some relation if you find some parallel object with respect to this uh, yeah, actually, connection, I, will have some uh, uh, some relation with Colonomy, of course. Actually, you can lift all of this to the cones. Yeah, yes. We know yes. that Jesus again manifold has killer cone, and if you and you can lift killing spinor on the cone, then you get parallel spinor. Mm. Actually, also, I since you get this character, and and this works also for the second order killing spinors, mm -hmm. but you needed to go to the to the first. Uh, you you need to do one step of prolongation. So yeah, so okay. You take uh, the spinor valued one form, which is yes. given by the first differential of psi, mm -hmm. together leave these two on the cone over your base manifold, and you will get parallel spinor valued one form. Yeah, actually, uh, since you get a uh, uh, look, you get this very nice characterization of Frisa Sakian manifolds. Okay, if you have, if you don't, if you have such a special second order spinner field, yeah. actually, maybe because of course you have this relation of uh, weak G2 structures and Frisa Sakian manifolds by Frederick, then you can think also another natural question is if you can characterize nearly Keller manifolds by this second order killing spinners. Nearly Keller manifolds are, are again very close. So, they have killing spinners already, you know this. So maybe it yeah, yeah. Apply they have killing spinners and not parallel. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. they have killing. Yeah, they, oh, oh, I mean, you, you mean this nearly killer in dimension six? Yes, yes. It's yeah. you are look um, under my perspective. You can see weak G2 manifolds, so nearly parallel G2 manifolds and nearly Keller uh, manifolds in dimension six and seven. Of course, you cannot claim that such structures are very similar. However, under my point of view, are very, very similar. Both admit skew torsion, parallel skew torsion. Okay. So, and then you can prove both the existence of killing spinners and also parallel spinners. I mean, there are two classes of manifolds that even in in the classification of colonomy groups with parallel skewed torsion, yep. you can see there will be, or uh, in the irreducible case, will be, or uh, some uh, natural reductive space, or these two classes. So I think something similar like your theorem about seven case, seven dimensional case, yeah. probably you can try to write down for six case for, 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 for six dimensional case. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think it will be possible probably. And actually, it is very interesting this. Um, this final slide is very interesting in yeah. this, uh, in this uh, second order killing spinner. So I think you can say probably more. Uh, even we can discuss something together. I, I find very interesting this uh, approach. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you for my side for the talk. So one, you you had that question or? So is there some other uh, some question to the lecture? One, you had. No, something? I uh, no, I also find the last slide, the last uh, this one, 
It's a very interesting, yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for your comments. So some other questions. Yes, also you can think, I mean, something natural that you can think it is, what is the curvature in the grapilities that you get after the second order killing experiment, you know? The, 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 yeah, yeah. The first, the first integrability condition is is exactly the same as for killing spinors. So you have the same relationship. To yeah, I see. So it's also Einstein your metric. And and it must be Einstein in 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 positive no, definite case. I, I'm sure 100 percent that also in nearly Keller minus you can say something. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, but the first integrability condition is exactly the same as for killing spinners. So yes, yes. Yeah, uh, yes, you can look here that this this term is symmetric and this term is symmetric. So, yes, I see. so just so, this term remains in the curvature and you, you mm -hmm. just get just the commutator of xy, which is exactly what you will get for. Mm -hmm for killing spinner, so. Yes, uh, okay, thank you. So may, may I ask? Um, yeah. you go so it's it's a bit unfortunate that you have to accelerate so much towards the end. Um, yeah. So uh, the, you know, the, most of the talk was, if I understand correctly, a review, uh, and then yeah. you have some new results listed here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I, I was preparing for some wider audience. Uh -huh. Yes, time. okay has but, to be uh, expert in differential geometry so yeah so i just want to understand like uh, the the theme of the of the results that you the new results that you're presenting is it uh, like taking known structures and then yeah it, it's taking known, it's it's taking known structure yeah. actually actually even this spinner field which characterizes the trisasakian structure in dimension 7 was already already known to Friedrich and Agricola, but we managed to dis describe it in by invariant equation, which... Okay, this, or, this parallel spin unit was already described by the parallel Lewis torsion. It's parallel, the, uh, by this torsion, you have a differential equation already. But of it, course, it's interesting, the second interpretation, this yeah. thing that also I gave an interpretation, that you can uh, describe this parallel spinner even in G2 manifolds, weak G2 manifolds, by using this torsion still, okay? So already your connection with Q torsion is very, very strong because actually this is your connection here. It's not the Levis Vita connection anymore. And actually, it's natural for me to forget a bit your Levis Vita connection and try to write down such a second order killing spinner equation, but with torsion. For me, it's very natural to try something like that. Yeah, okay, but it will be much more complicated. So. Yes, yes, but I actually, it will be this term plus the term that's coming from the torsion that actually you make global analysis is not so difficult to compute somehow in my mind. Yeah. I mean, the, the computation must be based just in the Clifford relation and global analysis. So in any case, I think it is because if you add the torsion, you can take this characterization, this parallel spin, or you say in Trisha Sakian or weak G2, that actually, you know, in this weak GT case, you have three cases. It depends if how many killing spinners you have. It is proper, it is three cases. And one of these yeah. cases, it is with the Trisha Sakian case. But okay, uh, this other discussion. Yeah, I think it's actually, lateral... actually, for this Trisha Sakian, yeah, this is the canonical spinner. And the yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Spinner, and you get the three killing spinners of the Trisha Sakian manifold. Mm. By uh, just by Clifford multiplying uh, this canonical spinner psi by these psi i's. Yes. By this killing uh, killing vector field psi i's times this second order killing spinner psi gives you the three killing ordinary first order killing spinners on the three second manifold, and actually this spinner. Uh, is also generalized killing spinner in the sense that it, it has different different killing numbers on two, yes. two different distributions. Yes. But the new contribution is that we have invariant invariant equation which which describes it without without uh, without explicit use of some additional structure. This is this is formulated yeah, yeah, okay. just this on the basis of the Riemannian of the... spin structure and that's all you don't need any distributions. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you once more. Okay. So some other question. Some other question or comments. Mark. Okay, so we are running out of our time. So if not, so we should thank the speaker again. 
Uh, thank you very much. And that's the end of our today's seminar. So thank you very much. Yes.